So the, the next paper was actually the runner-up for the best paper award. Uh, it has a nice, efficient title, Boundary Loss for Highly Unbalanced Segmentation, and it will be presented by Joel Kervadek. Uh, thanks. <coughs> so, hi, everyone. So, yeah, I will present our paper, Boundary Loss for Highly Unbalanced Segmentation. And so, first, I will discuss about the difficulty of highly unbalanced segmentation problems and how and why using a boundary information could be useful in this context. Then I will present our formulation, which is inspired from decades of literature and curve and level set evolution. And I will then well, present the evaluations that we did on two different uh, highly imbalanced brain data sets. But I will also present uh, preliminary results that we have on other applications that indicates that there is many more applications outside of highly imbalanced segmentation problems with the work we are presenting. So, Regional losses such as croissantropy, dice loss, and their derivatives are usually really sensitive to high class imbalance. Uh, we can see on this ground truth example, for instance, most, this, most of the image is background, and there is only a few areas that contain our object of interest, which is a brain lesion in this case. And when using a regional loss, usually the struggle to detect anything at all, or many parts are missing. And what we are presenting today helps to recover parts of the missing um, object of interest. But first, let's take a look at why regional losses uh, are struggling when there is a high imbalance between the different classes. So for simplicity, we'll take the formulation of a regular cross-entropy in a binary case, where omega is actually the image set, the set of pixels that we have and theta are the network parameters that we want to train. Uh, S of theta are our softmax probabilities, so continuous values between 0 and 1, and G is our ground truth, so the set of pixels that belongs to the object of interest. So this formation is just standard cross-entropy, but we can actually re rewrite it as a sum of two integrals, one on the region of interest, and one on the other region, which is the, the image minus the object of interest. So when we have a high class imbalance, what happens is that there is several order of magnitude difference in the size between those two regions. So the second, uh, the second integral is much bigger than the other one, and most of the feedback that the network is getting when we backpropagate on that will be about the background, hence creating this bias, making the network to predict mostly background. The other thing with regional analysis is that they tend to discard regional uh, spatial and boundary information. In this example, so we have a grand truth and we have some softmax prediction. And just for illustration, if we plot the gradient of a regional loss with respect to the softmax prediction, we can notice that it doesn't take into account at all the distance to the boundary of our object. We just have all this uh, neat information that's actually already contained in the label that we have that is, that is discarded and not used uh, with the regional loss. So we argue that having a loss that try to minimize uh, the distance between the two boundaries, the ground truth boundary and the predicted boundary, could use that extra information and also be less sensitive to that class imbalance because we, are not, we will not be dealing anymore with the regions themselves, background and foreground, but with the interface, with the interface and the boundary between the background and the foreground. So we'll have less imbalance in that. But it's actually challenging to do when we, what we have is a softmax prediction at the output of our neural networks. It's tricky to do directly because how do you define a boundary of a continuous values? So our work is inspired by discrete optimization technique in curve evolution and where actually it's a, a curve that's iterati iteratively updated to match a target shape. And the paper of uh, Yuri Boykov in, two a paper, Yuri Boykov in 2006 showed that actually when the two boundaries are close enough, so the boundary partial G, which is the boundary of the ground truth, and partial S in red, which is the boundary, your predicted boundary, their distance can be written as an integral over the boundary of G, where for each point in G, we find the point is 
in the boundary of S that is normal to it. And then we basically sum the distance between those two points over delta G. The problem with such formulation is that how do we find those points when we have softmax probabilities? We cannot say exactly when to stop if the probabilities are continuous. <laughs> so you will need to make several choices to define this boundary. And then once you make those choices, if you manage to define a boundary, then you will have the hard time to make that derivable. derivable. So you will not be able to backpropagate on that and use standard stochastic gradient descent to train your network. But it can be shown that this formation can uh, be equivalent in another formation where instead of integrating over the boundary of G, we'll now integrate over delta S, the area in gray between the two curves, and we will integrate the function dG, which is a distance map to the boundary of G. So now you could argue that this doesn't solve the problem, and that's right. Uh, to define the area between the two boundaries, we still need to define the second boundary. But this definition is easier to work with, and now we'll show how we can transform that to make something that can be used uh, to train a neural network. So we have this formation where we integrate over delta S, and we can actually define delta S as the union between uh, difference between the two sets, S the predicted area, and G is the ground truth. So we can rewrite this, uh, this uh, integral as an integral over S minus G plus an integral over G minus S. And we can also introduce a level set function, which will take, a neg which will take the value of the negative distance map inside G and positive distance map to the boundary of G outside of it. This will help us to negate, so to have some part of the equation to cancel each other, which will give us, in the end, uh, regional integrals of the level set function, one integral over S minus one integral over G, which is already easier to work with, but not quite. We can still modify it and uh, instead do an integral over the whole image and introduce um, indicator functions that will take the value one if the point belongs to the set, and the value zero if it's outside of it. So now that we have this formulation, we are almost done. We can easily plug our softmax probabilities in place of the discrete indicator function for S, and we end up with this formulation using our softmax probabilities, which is now derivable, and we can backpropagate and train a neural network with it without any modification whatsoever. We also notice that when training with respect to the network parameters, the second part of this equation will be a constant. So we can just ignore it for the sake of training our network. The, which gives us uh, this final formulation for our boundary loss, which is basically a pixel-wise multiplication between the level set, pre-computed level set function, which is a distance map to the ground truth, and the softmax probabilities that we already have. So the gradient with respect to the softmax to the network output will be the distance map to the ground truth. And uh, the level set uh, phi of G can be pre-computed only once at the beginning of the training. We don't need to recompute it at each iteration, which is a great advantage for sake of uh, computability. So we evaluated uh, this formulation on two different data sets, WMH and ISLESS. And I uh, also want to thank the authors for WMH for allowing us to use their data set to evaluate our paper. And what we did, since I mentioned earlier, if you remember, that the two boundaries need to be closed for the, that formulation to work. So we combine it with another loss, in this case, a uh, generalized dice loss that will help to localize initially, make the initial prediction of where the object is. And then by decreasing alpha over time, we'll shift the weight between the general dice loss to decrease its importance and increase the importance of the boundary loss. So basically, the general dice loss will kickstart the learning process, start to see where the object is, and then the boundary loss will help to refine the segmentation and the boundary around it. If we take a look at the results visually, we can see different kinds of improvement. 
we can see that uh, some false positive areas, when we train only with the GDL, tends to disappear when we train with the GDL plus the boundary loss. We can also have obtained smoother uh, boundary with less noise. There is no this little gap inside the object anymore. And it can also help to recover small areas that are tricky to detect and that uh, when training with the GDL we tend to miss. If we take a look at the, at the value, we can see big improvement uh, in both of dice and hours of distance, almost 8% improvement on iceless. And I want to reiterate that those results are with the exact same setting. setting. So we have the same neural network, the same upper parameters, the same scheduling on the, on the learning rate. All that's changing is our new boundary loss and the shifting weight between the two, those two losses. But those values are not the whole story. When we take a look at the validation metrics over time, we can see first the big gap between the two. That's easy to see. So in those plots, in red is a GDL with our boundary loss, and in cyan is a GDL alone. And what we can see is that, especially uh, at convergence, the GDL alone is still unstable on its validation performances. So it may seek more difficult to select which network uh, parameter we want to use for generalization. Because then when it's unstable, better metrics doesn't mean it's better, it means it got luckier on this specific data set. And you have no way of knowing which one is better generalizing. So that's a nice property to have, to, uh, to have the training stable at the end. And since the paper was submitted and uh, accepted, we did new experiments on other data set and application. Uh, we tried on ACDC, which is a cardiac segmentation data set with four classes, not a binary problem anymore. And we tried to train it, to train a neural network with only our boundary loss. So no other loss to guide the initial training. And we found that it's able to learn to segment uh, the object. So this seems to indicate that uh, the formulation might be resilient to, initial, to the initial mistakes in the segmentation, and in some cases, we might not need to combine it with another loss for it to work. Uh, we also had several feedback of people that used our boundary loss for their work, for their application, on uh, various, with various uh, modalities, and they reported increased performances, noticeable imp improvements on their application. So all that seems to indicate that there is many more applications where this loss could be useful, not just specifically for highly unbalanced uh, problems. And there is still many interesting works to do to figure out exactly when and how this boundary loss can be useful. So take home, the take home message is that we define a new computationally efficient loss uh, that uses the boundary formation. And that loss can be plugged directly into any fully convolutional neural network without the need to define new, to modify the network at all. You can just plug it and combine with your existing losses. Uh, we showed that it improves the results and stabilizes the training on two highly imbalanced data sets. And we also see that there is many other potential applications that still could benefit from this boundary loss. So the code is available online if you want to use it. Uh, if you're having trouble or if you're just having questions about how to use it, you can just create an issue on GitHub like many people did before. And if you have other, other questions that you, you want me to ask, you can either ask it right now or at the poster session where I believe our number is OM6. Thank you. So, um, here. Right here, yeah. uh, so there's other methods to also deal with unbalanced data. For instance, you could simply upweight the first term uh, and downweight the second term, right? Did you compare to those more standard uh, rebalancing approaches? Uh, we didn't compare much to other ones, but what we didn't show here is that we did not always use the rebalance term. We also tested with a fixed weight between the two losses. What we found actually is that uh, rebalancing during the training just uh, makes it easier to select the initial weight. You spend less time choosing your hyper parameters 
and that's the main benefit of it. You don't have to try different values to see what's the best one between GDL and the boundary loss. Hi, um, thank you for the talk. How would you recover small lesions that are outside? Because if you initialize with the generalized dice loss and you miss them, how do you recover them? Uh, well, there is still some mistake uh, that are not showed here. Uh, so those are still difficult problems. So I don't really have an answer for that. Sometimes they're recovered, some of them are, well, I guess there is more work left to, to do for those specific tasks. Hi, I'm right here, thanks. Uh, very nice uh, results and thank you for also releasing the code. Um, could you please comment whether some of these issues could be relieved by using a data-driven loss? So adding an adversarial, let's say, objective on top. Could you please comment whether such thing will basically obfuscate, alleviate some of the reasons? Do you still need specialized losses if we have adversarial data-driven losses on top? Thank you. You mean adversarial training? Yes, so let's say you add an additional adversarial loss on top of the supervised loss uh, that learn a data-driven one. Mm -hmm. uh, could you please comment on that? Um, I don't know about many marks in the, on the highly imbalanced data set, but I think that usually adversarial had some noise and instability during training. So actually it could make the instability already present even worse. Uh, that would be my guess. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, the, the idea, I mean, is brilliant. Um, and also the results is, looks quite good. Um, I'm wondering, uh, I feel that this loss may, may be more difficult to convert. Do you need any tricks on the parameter initialization or the optimizer or any uh, training during the training, do you have any specific requirement compared to the cross entropy or the no, dice loss? We didn't change anything about the optimizer. I think we just use standard Adam optimizer with the same hyperparameter for that one. And that's it. We didn't change anything else. How about the initialization? No, it was the same initialization. So all the, for example, for the class imbalance, you set the uh, in the first round of training, the result is more to the background or more to the foreground. Okay, can you say again? Um, I mean, your initial like, for the class imbalance, sometimes we set the initial segmentation to be the background because more pixels are background that's more close to the ground truth. So in your initialization, you set it more to the background or more to the foreground. Or there's no specific no, requirement. All the network parameters were initialized randomly, and we did not investigate other kind of initialization. Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. There is another question there. Hello? Yeah. Here. So you say you decrease alpha during the process? Yes. How, how does that work? Is that heuristically driven, or? Uh, well, it was fairly standard uh, scheduling. We started with, with an alpha close to one, actually, all we never had the weight of zero for any of the loss. And we just removed 0 0.01 to alpha after each epoch. There was another question, I think. Uh, yeah. No? Hi, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, in the case of multi class label segmentation, can we extend this to interaction between different objects, like surface-to-surface -surface distances? Let's say my car to left ventricle and then right ventricle, and then learn the configuration. Have you thought about that? I can't hear you much, but you're asking about multi-class. Uh, um, I can repeat the question. Yeah. So let's say that we're doing multi-class segmentation. Uh, with this formulation, your method can it learn the uh, interactions between objects, like surface-to-surface uh, -surface distances, and build a, the expected special configuration between different labels. Have you thought about this? Um, so I think we'll discuss that uh, maybe later on offline. Uh, but what we did in multi-class was to define e one distance map per class and then optimize all of those at once. So we did not deal directly with the interaction with the different class. We just have one distance map per class. Uh, 
All right. Uh, maybe one last, if not, then we can. Oh, okay, there's one. Yes, thank you. I, I think the original UNET paper also used uh, sort of a distance based weight to uh, focus on the edges of the different classes. So, isn't this sort of similar in that sense? To what paper? The original UNET sort of uh, paper where they, they were segmenting the cells. Also, the cell boundaries were giving additional weights with a distance map. Uh, I think you're referring to other neural networks that have an additional branch to predict the distance to the boundary. Is that the case? Um, yeah, I thought it was just the original paper where they used also uh, focusing on the edges to, uh, with a distance map. Okay, maybe we can take it offline. Yeah, it could be easier. All right, thanks. Sorry. All right, let's thank uh, the speaker. Hold on.